Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you to the final session on the penultimate day of Tata Literature Live 2020, the 11th annual Mumbai International Literature Festival and the first one to be completely digital. Huge thank you to our title sponsor Tata as well as our co-sponsors Tata Steel and Tata Projects. How amazing these last few days have been and we've had some terrific sessions and even though the festival is virtual, the books are real. We've also got some super sessions lined up tomorrow, so remember to log in to our website, tatalitlive.in, and earmark your favorite sessions for tomorrow. Welcome to our session this evening, Trial by Media, News Channels, or Kangaroo Courts. Now, Stephen Colbert said, Gravitas is the soup bone in the stew of television news. A free media is the guardian of citizens' rights and a safeguard against the excesses of authority. The Indian media has often played this role with courage and responsibility, but lately, the unworthy antics of some of our TV channels have begged us to ask the question, is it the compulsion of TRP revenues at work or an overwhelming hubris? And what can be done to restore a trusted and respected media? Helping us to understand the machinery at work today is our esteemed panel. Let me start off by welcoming Abhiruk Sen, who is an independent writer. He has been a reporter and editor for over 25 years, working in print, online, and broadcast media. He's written on a wide range of subjects, from cricket to terrorism, and most recently, crime. His best-selling second book, Arushi, shines a revealing light on the criminal justice system, media ethics, and middle-class attitudes in India. Welcome, Mr. Sen, to our panel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Our next panelist is Nagma Sahar. She's a senior editor and anchor with NDTV, and she is the host of ORF's weekly video series, India's World. Using her words as weapons, she has served the media industry for almost 19 years. With the theme resonate in her TEDx talks, she speaks of how the television industry is going through a rough patch where terms like credibility and integrity are struggling to fit in while the definition is facing evolution. Welcome, Ms. Sahar, to our panel as well. Thank you so much. We also have Ms. Karuna Nandi on our panel, who is currently unav unavailable to join us due to some technical difficulties, but she will be joining us soon. Let me uh, introduce her in the meanwhile. Ms. Karuna Nandi is an advocate of the Supreme Court of India and an international lawyer. Her litigation practice includes focus on constitutional and human rights law, commercial dispute resolution, tech regulation, media, and criminal law. And our chair today for this esteemed panel is Mr. Abhinandan Sekri. He is a writer, director, producer, and entrepreneur. He is the co-founder of News Laundry and Small Screen. And in the short time since its inception, News Laundry has won several awards for its journalism, including the prestigious Reading and Ramnath Goenka Awards. And Small Screen has won several awards for its digital, digital films and TV shows, including Highway on My Plate and OMG India. Now remember, you too can be a very important part of this session by sending us your questions. So while the panelists are talking, do send us your questions right through the session <coughs> along with your names through the chat boxes or comment panels on the platforms that you're, you're viewing this session on. And as soon as the Q&A session starts at the end of their discussion, then we'll be happy to field your questions to the panel and the chair. So keep those questions coming in along with your name. Now, let's get this session on the road. Trial by media, news channels, or kangaroo courts. Over to you, Mr. Abhinandan Sekri. Thank you, Maher. Um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, hope Karuna can join us soon. Uh, welcome, Aviruk. Welcome, Nagma. Hello. Hope you guys are well and safe. Yes. You are. yes. So uh, let me start with you, Nagma. Uh, you know, we've actually worked together back when Ajtak was a bulletin. At TV Today, I think it was sometime between 95, 96, 97. Um, we've, we've seen, I mean, I don't have to explain to the audience how panels have taken over jury, you know, judge, executioner. You've been in broadcast for long enough, and this is specifically problematic as far as broadcast is concerned. Do you recall how we got here? When did it start? Because you've seen the evolution. Or the DK. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for having me, first of all. And it, it, this is a 
and this is a problem that actually all of us are facing and call it a problem because there has been an excess of uh, I would say uh, media trial I totally agree that there is media trial and how we reached here Abhinandan actually when I look back and when I think of those days when Archduck was just a bulletin on Doordarshan from then to the evolution of the 24 hour news channels and the pressure to keep those 24 hour news channels going and interesting in terms of rating and for, for uh, you know getting those eyeballs uh, news deteriorated into sensationalism too we've all seen that there is a pressure of trp too there are the pressure there's a pressure of uh, of advertisers which uh, you know, independent media like yours, News Laundry, does not have. But when you are an organization which is also dependent on uh, on adverts, then I guess the pressure of ratings is much more because we've all seen there was a time, Abhinandan, when none of us as anchors were actually aware of the ratings of our shows. We were not told and we did not need to be told. We just did our work. But then came a point when all of us were told what the ratings of our shows were. And there were very good shows, even at NDTV, which is very different from many other organizations and where this pressure is uh, not so much. But even at NDTV, there were many shows which were very good and which were received well by the people. But it did not get the ratings because probably it did not have the masses watching them and with, and the shows were taken off or you know the anchors have been shifted too depending on the ratings because if the show does not really have a rating you do not I think no, no probably channel will have the show on but how did we get here you know from a single uh, news channel or then you know 24 hour news channels and then so many news channels and the pressure so now what we see is instead of giving news everyone is into giving opinion in a way is underestimating the intelligence of the audience and is actually feeding the audience with what they believe and I feel that increasingly also because there is the additional social media there so we are living in the time of the media and the social media trials so we are inundated with opinion and everything is just too polarized on the social media uh, on Twitter, on even Facebook, I have seen families and friends not talking to each other because they have difference of opinion. So we've gradually reached a point where everything, even even like recently a Riya Chakravarti matter, who's for Riya Chakravarti and who's against Riya Chakravarti's trial by media, was actually dictated by where you belong, the so-called liberal space or the so-called the rightist. So you know, we reached this place where everything is kind of seen through a lens and there is no just giving out the news. It's TV space is dominated by debates. I should not be actually calling them debates, but very loud anchors, screaming anchors and a lot of cacophony. Right. Thanks. Uh, so, I mean, obviously the economic consideration, the revenue model being broken and like you said, you know, We've been saying this for the longest time that if there's anything that can save, uh, you know, journalism in the news world, it is a transition to a different revenue model, uh, which is possible in the digital age. I don't know how broadcasters are going to keep up with that, or will they become redundant? But Aviruk, you uh, have written uh, a book on one of the most uh, worrying cases. Karuna is here. Hi, Karuna. Hi. Sorry, Takeshi. Okay, so uh, we just about started, and Nagma has given her opening comments. I'm just going to Aviruk. Uh, so Aviruk, you wrote that book on the Arushi case, and I remember there were some videos of the Arushi's uh, coverage of outside how the media was behaving. And I remember how um, shocked people were back then. And there was a pushback. I mean, there was some sort of shame among channels and anchors who had perpetuated that. And we know that that the coverage of that case had real world consequences. It wasn't just this one hour entertainment session every night and then Rath Gai Baat Gai. People's mm -hmm. lives, you know, were impacted yeah. Yeah. in a significant way. Now, uh, when you did your research and when you wrote that book, did you ever get any idea of how the judiciary had reacted to that? What, I mean, was there any uh, opinion of judges of the, judici uh, of, of the judiciary, whether it was lawyers or, or uh, judges, of what impact that had? And did that have any 
was was there any sense that this needs to be toned down and if so how without without an assault on 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 uh, journalism hi uh firstly thanks for having me abhinandan great to see you again so let me just address uh, this question in two parts um you were asking whether the the media covered the carpet bombing so to speak uh, of uh, the arushi case on television and and elsewhere in print whether it had a, an impact on the minds of judges or or lawyers or that community of people who would actually sit in judgment i mean whose job it is to do that now uh, actually karuna will probably have this uh, 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 at her fingertips um you know there was there's a quote by oliver wendell holmes who's uh, uh, well very well known uh, american jurist and uh, one of the things that he said i'm paraphrasing here i don't recall the quote exactly is that uh, whatever happens in the outside world doesn't just bypass people who sit as judges in in court they are affected by it just like you and me uh and that's actually the the idea of a, a truly independent judiciary you know people put on a pedestal somewhere and and life goes on beneath them uh is i think a myth i think uh they they consume the media just as much as we do and would have their own sort of confirmation biases and stuff like that you know like everybody else i mean it's their training i suppose that helps them separate uh you know the two roles but to 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 think that there's no effect at all is incorrect the other thing is that in the in a case like the arushi case when you have a tide of popular opinion where everyone believes one thing for a judge that's a great disincentive to go against that opinion against that tide especially in the lower courts once again karuna will probably you know have something to say on this because what will happen immediately at a lower court level is that if the judge goes against the tide of public opinion uh it will turn against him or or her as it were and basically the if 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 he acquits when everyone thinks uh people are guilty there'll be charges like bribery and fixing and stuff like that uh so i mean in my view the a, a sort of a true independence independent mindedness which is blind or deaf to all media noise is not possible it's not realistic and uh, did you when you were researching your book did you have um, any in depth conversations with the talwars oh yes several several so at, at any point did have they expressed a keenness to uh, go to court against the channels that made some rather um, you know yeah. irresponsible remarks and <laughs> remarks uh, and outright you know uh, yeah calling them out so have actually, you considered that and and where is that now what did, what do they say what is the recourse um okay so let me just take this back to to then uh, when this was all happening now um i'll give you an example one of the stories that was circulated quite widely uh in both print and tv at the time was that dr talwar had booked 10 rooms in a delhi hotel for some kind of massive uh, sex party right um there was not a single line of confirmation from anybody a about the booking and naturally about you know uh what what was purportedly happening there no one from any hotel ever gave any sort of confirmation no cop spoke on record saying we have this information but it was run very you know it 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 was run for two or three days i think and eventually the talwars went to the cbi because they understood that it was coming from there and said that look uh this kind of you know maligning us like this is just hurting us really badly so please do something about it the cbi issued a clarification saying that these there's no substance at all to any of this not one single media house recanted the story so we have to look within ourselves uh first and foremost you know uh and our reluctance to admit our mistakes i think is our greatest weakness i see karuna um welcome um the judicial angle um 
to what extent does it actually uh, influence the judiciary and b is there a recourse because a uh, you know regulation is something that's a very you know tricky subject to discuss and that's not the mandate right now and that becomes long and complicated but in the courts when the kind of stuff that is being said was being said about riya chakravarti uh, in the talwar's case not just opinion outright lies is there a possibility that the intervention can be judicial rather than a regulatory intervention to stop these kangaroo courts or at least control them oh absolutely there are lots of judgments in place for example the sahara was sebi right which is supreme court judgment in which chubroto roy sahara was um meant to deposit a huge amount of money which he still has in that matter right? but he was meant to deposit a huge amount of money because of the um chit fund uh, chit fund scam that he was accused of now there were various points at which including just before the supreme court was to have a very important hearing the next day that the media basically went to town as as we know how they sometimes do um and the judgment that was was placed i think was quite a reasonable judgment and that's a judgment that encapsulates um the law on a particular sub uh, this particular sub issue it says that you can postpone the reporting right so don't cut it off but you can postpone the reporting you can say look after this particular point the reporting can be extensive etc but until this point we don't want anyone influence and we don't want a media circus um there are other judgments to say that we don't want witnesses influence there is the contempt jurisdiction that uh, many of us don't think should be struck down because of course with you know the prashant bhushan case and a number of different cases this conversation happened and i think most people believe that where there is a substantial interference with justice that is the point at which you either delay reporting or you uh, uh you deal with that in a particular way but you know i will say um abhinandan and aviruk and nagma that i don't think that there is no place for media reporting concurrently during a trial i think there is also a very important place that the media has now why do i say that because in situations where for example with asaram bapu right where the power differential is really really massive where one side has um effectively captured due process right and the other side has very little recourse where one side in some cases even has access to massive media you know we actually have uh, you know situations where um i've seen pr agencies that specialize in court cases now you know and deal with such a situation and and i'll come back to aviruk's uh, point about why why this exists because of course there is discretion in the mind of the individual judge that cannot be completely ignored that the and so let's come to that separately but i do think that there is a place for fair comment in the media without prejudging guilt or innocence in order to make sure due process works now i think one of the things that this immediately gives rise to the uh, the the questions is with regard to me too because a lot of the accused i think would argue that there was no due process here why didn't you just go to court and i think the distinction there is that the complainants feel in those cases that they are not being served currently by the due process that we have managed to build in the courts and that is not good enough as yet and therefore what they are doing is that they are committing an act of civil disobedience knowing that they will be sued for defamation and many of them have right by the big powerful men who were big and powerful enough to uh, allegedly molest them in the first place and also have act the most friends of lawyers and to say the right so many of them i the crumble or withdraw the complaints or say that look i don't want to go forward with this now coming to aviruk's point which is that we like to have the illusion that the 
hugely qualified men and women in the upper judiciary and also in the lower judiciary, many of whom have given up lucrative careers, okay, to serve the nation. Um, we like to we like to have the illusion that everybody is unbiased. Now, the point that Avi Rook is making about the ability to sift wheat from chaff, that is something that as lawyers, from the time that we are law students, you know, up to 20 years in the profession, like about 20 years in the profession, like me, up to the point where people are judges, this is something that people are very rigorously trained to do. Sift the wheat from the chaff, the fact from the fiction, right? However, we are all human. There is a particular discretion that judges have, not just in their constitutional jurisdiction, whether it's 226 in the high courts or whether it's Article 32 in the Supreme Courts or 136 and 142. These are just numbers, but, uh, but our Supreme Court has one of the widest jurisdictions of any Supreme Court in the world, right? And so the background that we bring with us, to some extent, will shape our idea of justice. Whether it's the bully danda that we played in the streets when we were kids, whether it's the whether we read, you know, to kill a mockingbird, whether we sort of got sort of strains of the Manu Smriti growing up, whether we read, you know, various whether we read Oliver Wendell Holmes, whatever it was. So I think to say that subliminally that um, some of the what is being reported will not influence. Um, I, I think that would be wrong. I think that, you know, in many cases, subliminally, some of these things will influence. So, for example, we saw the idea of the anti-national that was being bandied about. And, you know, everyone says complete nonsense. It has no basis in law. And then we saw in a high court judgment about uh, five or six years ago, we saw it creeping its way in. So I would love to see actually Aviruk, uh, I would love to see you or someone else doing a kind of empirical study or even a narrative study, looking at language that has crept through from the media into and you know the irresponsible media. Let me be clear because uh, you know I've seen I've seen reports by all three of you and you know let's be clear that it's not everybody that's participating in this nonsense, right? Um, and so to see how and when they creep in, and I think this is very important because I think it will help inform judicial intervention and, you know, us asking for judicial intervention, lawyers, the, the, the entire legal community, in with a bit of data to look at to what extent it should be tailored, to what extent it should be tailored, and tailoring is everything, to not have the prohibition be overbroad um, and for it not to also, I think, be too narrow. Right. Um, you know, um, Nagma, uh, coming to you, first of all, uh, it's not my um, case and I, I hope it's not any, any journalist's case that there should be a restriction on the coverage. I do think that will be more problematic than, you know, uh, the kind of coverage we get if those are the things that I have to choose between. Uh, I think we can all agree on it's the aesthetic uh, and not just the very fine nuanced aesthetic, just the basic way that journalism or news channels are run, the kind of stuff that is done. So since we are all human, judges are human, reporters are human, editors are human, people who run news platforms are human. Magma, uh, I've had uh, several conversations, many people who we both worked with in the past, uh, whose uh, new avatars are unrecognizable from the people I knew when I was young. And I have actually um, asked with one of them. I worked with Ornom when I was 19 years old. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, and I've asked, you know, some of them that, why do you do this? And uh, at least some of them are very clear that that's the only way I can put food on the table. Of course, they kind of make it too much of a bechara deal. It's not like they are starving. They are driving cars that cost as much as a small apartment. But the fact is that it is a commercial interest that makes them do this. Many of them don't believe the nonsense that they spout and they have said as much to me. Now, I believe that the, the toad of this is commercial. I mean, there have to be brands who have to be held accountable. There has to be public pressure. There has to be shaming. Does shaming our friends and professionals work? Or are we way beyond that because of the kind of, let me take Trump's example, you know, the kind of stuff that he's been tweeting. Yeah. The kind of news platform he's been tweeting. 
you know, Najel Faraj just tweeted fake news and he doesn't delete it. The, the assumption was that you can shame someone into doing the right thing. Has social media completely thrown that out of the window? Have you, in your interactions, seen any of our former colleagues say that, you know, I'm a little ashamed of what I do or they don't care? No, some of them, Abhinandan, some of them have actually personally, even in a one-to-one -one interaction, mm -hmm. have said this, that, you know, we really envy what you guys do and we very, I feel bad and we feel very, very ashamed what we, you know, the way we are presenting the news. So some of them have mentioned, but those are very rare people who've said that they actually do not like what they're doing, but they have to do it. It's a compulsion. But there are many others who are clearly are not ashamed. And when you say, does shaming work? I think it just doesn't work now. We've gone beyond that. So social media, Twitter has thrown that out of the window completely. And what you said earlier, we do need that press freedom, but there is a very fine line where press freedom ends and the media trial begins. And I feel if you look at the recent past, so many of these instances have been cases, blatant cases of media trial. For example, let me begin with that Sushant Singh Rajput case where one woman, Riya Chakravarti, was vilified, was act really vilified because you know, you can report on what happened, but there are news channels, there were Hindi news channels which were using terms like Vish Kanya, and it became like a soap opera. Day in, day out, people are just watching what's happening with Riya Chakwarti. They have just assumed that she is the villain. Well, you know, I feel that when the matter is sub -judice, you can report on it. You definitely report on it, but you do not start forcing your opinion on the public, which actually impacts the, the the judgment because, you know, you all agree with that, that judges are also, they cannot really remain immune from public opinion. We've seen many such cases. And if the judgment is not in favor of the public opinion, it's really difficult for the judges. We've also seen those cases. And, uh, you know, I talked about the Riyaj Kribadi case. Let's look at what's happening on social media. We saw that Huma Qureshi and Anurag Kashyap thing. Huma Qureshi came and I'm talking about the Me Too. Huma Qureshi had to write, a, uh, put it out that I do not agree with what is being, uh, the way my name is being dragged into this. Richa Chadda, she sent a legal notice for her name being uh, continuously dragged in the Anurag Kashyap uh, controversy. We've also seen recently that Akshay Kumar has filed a defamation case against someone who was dragging his name there. So when people react or start filing these cases, probably some of those people will be discouraged also to do this. But look at the Katwa uh, gang rape case where, uh, you know, even before the judgment or the court gave any judgment, media pronounced the decision that some of the accused were innocent and not guilty of the offense. So we've seen it there. I, let me also add that when justice, because a lot of people talk about this, that if this is media trial, what about the Jessica Lal campaign that exactly. certain media channels yeah. had? Exactly. That's what I want to come to, yeah. Yeah, you know, so justice for Jessica case, okay, yes, maybe it was also a media campaign, but it was a clear-cut case of murder, and Karuna will probably help us understand the distinction here. There has also been very positive impact of the media playing a very active role. I remember in July 2006, there was a little boy, probably six-year-old or eight-year-old prince, who had fallen into a board well. And I remember that was one of the first cases, a televised case of a kid being actually uh, rescued from a board well, a 60 yeah. feet board well. But because the media kept the vigil and we were on the news, you know, we saw that happen. Okay. It was a big, big story. So a lot of times media has had a very positive impact uh, on the society in following a case. But what we see now, the very fine line of where we're pronouncing judgments and influencing public opinion when the matter is sub is actually uh, is fading. And that's what is very dangerous because we are living in times of not only media trial, but social media trial. So that's something uh, that we need to be very careful about. So, uh, Aviruk, you know, like Nagma mentioned, I remember the Jessica Lal case, that case seemed done and dusted, it was, you know, it would just keep to carry on and as the film is made, no one killed Jessica. And it was media activism that made the case be investigated and finally some closure came about. So uh, I guess one can't pick and choose that, you know, we'll allow it here, we won't allow it there. 
Um, in that context, where do you see it going from here? Because that happened before social media came about. And it's right. very clear social media is playing a huge impact. I mean, it's the wag the dog situation happening rather than right. media scrutiny, you know, journalistic filters, putting out information, and then social media reacting to that information. It is legacy media that is figuring out what social media wants and then it's, it's happening the other way around. Okay. Where do you think it's going to head? Because clearly we're in a transition. We are, this is a new beast. Everyone's getting used to it. Uh, there was a time I remember websites, comment section was full of nonsense. Now they're not. I guess those have moved to, so, uh, to uh, Twitter. Uh, right. But where mm. do you think going from here? You think we will get used to social media and then you can get back to a new normal? Or this beast is going to feed this furnace, so the you know, flames singe us all? I, I wish I could see the future as, as clearly as you expect me to. But, <laughs> but uh, so now just, just to address a few things, I think, which, which have come out of this, this discussion, uh, where it will go, to be honest, I don't know. However, there's some things that have happened. I mean, this is not the age of um, information explosion. A lot of people, you know, use that cliche. I actually feel it's, a, it's the age of information exclusion where a sliver of information from a shared reality comes to you and you want only that and because you want only that it keeps coming to you yeah and it's a world where you are right and everybody else is wrong so uh so this feeds into i think the bubbles that people live in which is like if 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 it's a viewer of republic tv he will not watch ndtv at all yeah and vice versa. Now, so that's the sort of world that, that, that we live in now. And what has happened is, as a result of this, and this is something that's actually predates social media, in my view, news um, presentation especially, news presentation more than just the 24-hour cycle of going to a spot and, and you've, and we've all, I suppose, done it in various, at various levels of competence. You are very high, me very low. Anyway, so see, uh, so um, but, but what happened, according to me, uh, Abhinandan, is that you know around the mid two thousands when there was a television boom in in India, which it was an entertainment television boom. Let's try and recall those days when the Sasbahu serials were uh, were sort of really making you know money for channels, where. Uh, something crept into news coverage. Do you remember all the Bhut Preet stories that would come in every evening? Yes, I remember. So, in my view, uh, Madam Ekta Kapoor, who I think is uh, India's finest uh, social scientist, figured out that the television owning middle class has an appetite for this sort of stuff. And having seen that in entertainment, news channels kind of imported part of that. And if you're going to be entertainment, then what you need is not anchors like Nagma who are sort of straight and narrow. You need characters and entertainers. According to me, that is what has happened, that all of these guys are actually in character. I mean, you said it yourself. When you ask them, why do you do this? They will you know, make the excuse of uh, you know, having to put food on the plate but they're all playing a role it's actually it's not it's an assigned role it's like acting in a film or a, or, or uh, you know a yeah. television serial yeah so uh, so i think that's what's happened and i think it goes if this business predates social media what has happened with social media is that the amplification and the compartmentalization that's happened as a result has hardened everyone's positions uh, you know completely so now the way back is to what? Delete the internet? <laughs> I don't know. So I, the, the point of this is that everything that we do, first of all, the computer knows. I mean, he knows you. I mean, I, in a piece I wrote recently, I compared the algorithm to, a, to being a blind, to a blind artist. You know, someone who knows just a few things about you, knows what you like, uh, knows what you frown at. And 
knows most importantly what engages you, what keeps yeah. you on your computer. And what this blind artist does is that he creates a sketch of you and you add to that every day with every click, you give him more information. In and, fact, uh, I, sorry, I, sorry no, I was I, rambling. No, uh, no, that's fine. Uh, it's, um, you know, the boom you're talking about, I benefited from that boom. We made a lot of, uh, you know, television shows, in fact, from a two man organization, small screen grew to 50 and Aruna and my friend Rocky and Mayu's show <laughs> made us super successful. So, but I will tell you as a television professional, I used to produce shows for channels from, you know, uh, entertainment channels, well, not the GEC, but the lifestyle channels. I used to make shows for the news channels. There were, there was audience segmentation. There was different kind of programming being done by the end of the 2000s and you know when we got into the 10s and 11s and 12s every channel i can tell you from experience wanted the same kind of show it was you're playing for the bank you're betting the bank you don't want a sliver of the audience that makes you sustainable everybody wanted big boss everybody wanted a reality show um and i think that's how the kind of the commerce evolved but before i go into the question answer karuna you know your, your legal uh, expertise aside just as a news consumer, um, where do you, I mean, has your viewing habits changed? You used to watch a lot of television news, I'm sure at some point. Now, do you at all? Uh, where do you see social media taking us as a user of social media and not necessarily the legal aspects of uh, the interventions that may or may not come? Okay. Just between you and me, let this be our secret. I have never really had the time to watch much television news. <laughs> Dear God. I watch the newspaper, I read the newspaper. Um, I haven't, I, I, I'm a lawyer, you know. It's a very, very demanding profession. Um, and I've never had the time to watch much television news. However, I do see, I watch clips. At times, I watch clips off of social media, off of Twitter and Facebook, and we know the problem with that, right? The problem with that is that the my Twitter and Facebook is as you know will be inevitably polarized. Why? Because the computer that Aviruk is speaking of is actually human beings, people behind the algorithm deciding what I will watch and what I will not watch because that will lead, lead me to click on particular advertisements is what fuels the what we watch. Let's be very clear. It is the shortest route to purchase that fuels what I watch. We are the product. We are not the consumer. We are the product. The consumer is actually the company that's buying the ads. Let's be really clear about that. Yes. I think that one thing that um, one way in which there has been a massive shift is that social media to a significant extent is powering what the news is going to be. Very frequently, frequently we see news following the hashtag as opposed to the hashtag following the news, right? Exactly. We know the hashtag is deeply right. imperfect because the hashtag is frequently powered by a bunch of people that are organized by the BJP, right? Or a bunch of people that are organized in a different way, but the BJP is particularly good at this. I think one thing that hasn't yet come into this discussion is the fact that all of this is not just driven by commerce, it is very much driven by politics. The yes. politics may also be driven by commerce, that's a, that's a separate issue. However, the politics is extremely well funded, the electoral bonds case has still not been heard. We don't know which companies are funding the BJP, also the Congress, but 90% of the money under the electoral bond scheme is over 90% is going to the BJP. They also liberalized the rules uh, under the Finance, uh, amend finance um, Act, which was amended, um, so that companies with significant foreign holdings can also finance political parties, even as they tighten the screw on the NGOs and what little bit of money that NGOs can get to help whatever, you know, people that they're trying to help. So, 
Absolutely. And let's be clear, I am no, you know, anti-corporate person. I represent a large number of corporates, right? However, like human beings, I can't be tarred with the same brush. Corporates can't be tarred with the same brush. And sometimes the politics forces even good-hearted, decent corporates with decent boards to do something because otherwise they're not going to get the license that they're otherwise legitimately due. So therefore, we have a situation where the social media is effectively being run by the people who buy the, uh, buy the ads and where the politics is to a very significant extent being run by people who fund the political party, right? Which is not to say that the political party, uh, party doesn't have its own uh, motivations and let us be clear that the political party is also conflated with the state. So we saw the way that it went after NDTV and how NDTV in, the, in those tax cases, that they were then ultimately exonerated. And then immediately you have the state organizations going after them again, right? So we have a sort of, we have these sorts of witch hunts um, that are happening against unfriendly media organizations. We have the non-granting of government ads. And so there are ways in which the BJP and the state is controlling sections of the media and going after unfriendly media. And also we see the corporate connection through the uh, BJP and the state, but also through uh, the social media that is controlling what you and I watch. So therefore, when we look at trial by media, who's trial by media? Are we looking at the recent, what is his name? The man who's, uh, uh, who's allegedly raped the young woman in his ashram recently in UK, uh, right? Chinmayanan. 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 So yeah. we have the Chinmayanan case and you look at the reporting around that where there was some media voice, and it's very interesting to see the media houses that raise their voices, the media houses that raise their voices and then stamped down and sort of said, never mind. Um, and you also see how the trial went. I think the last point that I want to make here, but I think it's an important point, is that what happened in the Jessica Lal case was that there was a lot of blatant evidence at the outset, it appeared. Subsequently, the witness protection program seemed to fail uh, the, the most important witnesses. When the trial court judgment was passed, it was passed on the evidence. And let us be clear that in a robust judicial system, that is all a judge can do. A judge does not decide what is truth and what is not. Sure. A judge decides what, what rises to the level of a conviction or not based on the evidence. So according to me, the trial court judge was possibly right. What happened is that, and in fact, he said that I know that Manu huh. Sharma has killed Jessica Lal. You, you, you're smiling because you remember this evidence. I know that Manu Sharma, is, but the evidence does not demonstrate that. Sure. There was and he was, there was censured, was censured for it. He was censured for saying that. For it because you understand why? Because look, either you go this way or that. You can't, you can't say that, right? Yeah. But his, yeah. he did his job. When it went to the high court, until the time that the high court convicted him, there were huge protests, huge candlelight marches seeking justice. But the thing is that the candlelight marches seeking justice didn't quite know what they were asking for, right? They didn't quite know that what they were really asking for is to make sure that there were proper witnesses, witness protection programs and to make sure that Shayan, I think his name was, you know, Shayan, was yeah. the witness that was potentially compromised, right? That was potentially threatened or whatever. Um, yeah. And so at that point, when the person was convicted at the high court level, it's not at all clear that there was sufficient evidence at that point. So I think the onus is really on us in the justice system to strengthen the justice system to such a level that the tailoring, and I, I think you're wrong there, uh, <laughs> and then on that, that you can't have any limits on the media. I think there have to be some limits on the media, right? Um, in the Arushi case, ridiculous. We have the result of that. We have these people, you know, in jail for so long. We have Riyal Chakravarti. I was one of the few people who was, and I was, you know, hence called on and I was ignoring the thing for a long time. I thought it was nonsense. But then I found that this woman was being victimized in this way. It was a total and absolute classic witch hunt in the technical sense of the word, right? There are a number of witches who are killed to this day in this country. Mm -hmm. And so I started sort of defending her. 
And I was the one person who was appearing on all these different channels because nobody else was at that point. Here's this young woman spent months in, right? For no reason. So this, this Arushi problem is happening to this day, which is why I think that there are some very well-tailored limits on the media that must happen. All right. I um, uh, just wanted to add that there's uh, already, already okay. with the Supreme Court has also... I want to go to the question answers, Sorry, but yeah, okay. go ahead, make right. a point quickly. Yeah, all right. Now, I just wanted to say that the Supreme Court has also uh, cautioned against media trial, which might hamper the administration of justice. And uh, we all know that, uh, you know, there is the NBA is already there for the regulation. The point is that it should do, uh, the media channels have to adhere by the directives, the self-regulation that's already in place, there has to be a limit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the line has to be drawn. Around the regulation, yeah, I think it's a little more tricky and complicated. But yeah, let's yeah. go to the question answers. I'll you know give it to Meher from the Litfest, who shall give us the questions that our audience wants to ask. But uh, before we do that, I always say that unless you pay for the news, nothing's going to change. So as the news consumer, you have to make yourself the consumer, not the advertiser, because then the public pays, the public is served, and the advertiser pays, the advertiser serves. Meher, all yours. Uh, we'll take the questions from the audience now. Super. And we have a storm of questions. Uh, as you know, this is a hotly debated topic. So we have a whole bunch of questions from our viewers. Suptika Das says, how do I know that the opinions I hold, mainly influenced by news and social media, are neutral and unbiased, since now we are often recommended the news we like to watch, not the ones we need to? Um, Nagma, you want to do that? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, just wanted to make a quick point. I really think that there is nothing uh, like neutral news. Exactly. All, all news is kind of, you know, and I like Abhinandan has been going and saying repeatedly about the advertisers. Um, so the interests of the advertisers are served. Having said that, I'm not saying that all channels are just serving the interests of the advertiser, but there is some kind of bias not in all the reporters, the way they're reporting, but in the editorial, the way the news is presented. So there is no really neutral news. But uh, for the viewers, I think they need to source that information if they really want to get to the bottom of a story or to, to know all sides of the story from different sources. Uh, Abhiruk, I think, just mentioned about NDTV and Republic TV, as what viewers of Republic TV will not watch NDTV and vice versa. So as somebody who's actually as a, as a news consumer, if I'm neutral or if I want to know the different aspects of the news, then I should have the patience or the tolerance to watch or get my news or source my news from different channels and, and, and then probably analyze uh, what I want to understand rather than let those screaming, shouting anchors decide for me what I should understand of a particular news. So that's one of the ways that you can follow. I mean, I will just say this, you know, as a news professional myself, that News should be an active consumption habit, mm -hmm. not a passive consumption habit. It's not like you watch TV or you scroll down on Facebook and keep clicking on whatever comes your way. You have to actively seek out some platforms. I think how you consume news has to be an active process and, and, and not a passive receiving process. That's what, that's what I'll say. Yeah, but I just wanted to add just in a line, Abhinandan, if I may, uh, you know, uh, we are all kind of right that there's no such thing as unbiased news, but there is such a thing as rational, verifiable news. Yes. And that in itself is the strength of the best media houses in, in the world. Th those things. It is not, I mean, news in the end is, is not just a list of facts. It's an arrangement of facts. And that arrangement, I suppose, is what, uh, gives it a bias or a spin or whatever it is. But each of those facts need to be reasonable and verifiable or verified. Yeah. Absolutely. So hence, checking your news from various sources. I just have something very brief to add. I think that, um, look, there was a comic book of John Cassavetes and uh, Cinema Verite. And what they did was that they just wanted to follow people around um, I mean, it's more complicated than that, as filmmakers will attest to. But they didn't want to use background music and particular camera angles to seduce the viewer into a particular perspective, right? And that is a deference to the intelligence of uh, a viewer. Um, 
Now, I think that when it comes to news, there are two things. The first is that a lot of television news, with notable ex exceptions, um, seeks to do the opposite. Like, you have the public TV, which on the occasion, on the occasion I did have to switch on the television, I was startled to see flames rising from the bottom. I'm not kidding. There were flames rising from the bottom. And there was, uh, you know, the anchor was, was screaming and sort of doing all sorts of things. And then there were 20 people there and they were all shouting. Republic TV, I, I don't go on. Um, times now I've also limited my engagement. But there are particular anchors that I would engage with, right? So now the thing is that um, if you are reading the newspaper, there is a way in which um, there is a distance between you and what you are looking at. And there is an opportunity, there's a greater opportunity, I think, for you to form a critical perspective and form your own views. But I also think that what is absolutely fundamental now for us to be teaching our children and for schools to be teaching students, for us to just incorporate into the discourse today, is a, the ability to think critically. What I, what is the WhatsApp forward I'm reading? It's something that sounds plausible. Is it correct? Right? The, should I be, you know, what is the, what is the heuristic? What is the uh, thought mechanism through which I approach different kinds of information? Am I facile with the internet? Do I say I read something on Google? which as you know, as we all know, is ridiculous. Or do I say that I read a peer reviewed article on PubMed, which gave me a nuance of what happens if I do this in a COVID situation? Or did I read a WhatsApp forward? Because these, I must understand, are two very different things. Yes. Right. right. Uh, on that note, uh, I'd like to ask the second question, which is from Nishan. Uh, is it possible for media to effectively self-regulate itself? Just, I'll, uh, may I answer that? It's entirely possible. In England, they had a mechanism through which there was a consensual and binding mechanism by which there were orders that are passed down and that they have to be implemented. It's a sort of combination of contractual and statutory in terms of the mechanism. The current mechanism that exists is, uh, you know, while I was thinking about this particular conversation, I was looking at the press council guidelines on media trials, which are fantastic. They're great. Everyone ignores them, right? But not binding. Not just are they not binding, everyone completely ignores them. Right. Uh, you have the... Uh, you have the news broadcasters organization, and we are Justice Secretary. Justice Secretary is fantastic, by the way. Um, and he passed these various orders, and now they're going through the judicial system. And so that now it's taking a more active role. And let's see what happens with that. But frankly, the the it's a wrap on the knuckle when it comes to if you see the how much money is made by each broadcast that was wrapped, right? It's a drop in the well. So there's no commercial disincentive there. It's, it's a little bit of egg on face, but I don't think it's enough egg to actually be a deterrent. Because, and there's an op apology you're supposed to put up prominently, but it's not enough to be a deterrent. Uh, our next question is from Isha. She asks, is media pol contributing to the extreme polarization in the country? I think, yes. sorry, can yes. I answer that? I just wanted to say that uh, it is. And it's not just television media, but more so social media. And everyone has uh, mentioned WhatsApp. And I think it's WhatsApp to a big, big extent. Uh, whatever a lot of people, though we should consume our news uh, in a different way, but sadly, uh, a lot of people, the majority is consuming news from WhatsApp and actually taking it to be gospel truth. And they actually say, uh, you know, in the villages, uh, also in, in towns, a lot of people actually come and tell you that they've seen it on WhatsApp and they think that it is true. They don't even want to verify it. And they, and WhatsApp world, or it, whether it is Twitter, it's just too polarized, mm. heavily polarized. So when if you are continuously on Twitter for a couple of hours, you will 
feel everything is wrong in your world. Or if you watch TV, you will think that people are just so divided, everything is polarized. Even if Riya Chakravarti is guilty or not guilty, is colored by which side are you on? Are you liberal or are you actually a rightist or are you a centrist? But otherwise, things are not so bad. You know, I think media has a big role. Social media has a big role in polarizing and coloring your vision. Mm. Uh, our next question is from Kamna. She asks, is trial by media actually a symptom of a poor legal system? When people can't get legal recourse, they turn to the media to raise awareness of, about issues. Anyone? Panelists or chair? Um, I'll let the lawyer take that. Yeah. Uh, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Uh, is, is, a, is the trial by media actually a symptom of a poor legal system? When people can't get legal re recourse, they turn to the media to raise awareness of issues. Look, I mean, I think a poor legal system is, um, I think that's a bit, that's a bit extreme. Um, but I think the legal system can serve particular litigants badly. I think that's true. Uh, in the Me Too cases, I think this was true, that a lot of women felt that their rape, their sexual assault, uh, their sexual harassment was not something that they could take to the legal system. And therefore, they felt compelled to come out in the public domain, risking huge um, damages, risking the having to give huge da damages and defamation. And even, you know, being sued in criminal defamation, because that for some reason still exists in this country, right? Yeah. Um, and that I think was an act of civil disobedience. Now people said to me that, look, as a, uh, uh, as an entity in the, as a legal, as a lawyer, as an entity of the, you know, judicial system, do you not think that due process is something that should have been followed? And of course it should be followed, but as somebody who represents rape victims, I know that you have to give every single thing you've got and a huge, you know, big teams, a high level of competence to, um, even though the public prosecutor is meant to be the main entity that's prosecuting the case and they're meant to be the, for the people who are seeing it through to get justice. And so I do think that the, uh, our legal systems, we haven't reached a place where we are serving um, justice and serving citizens um, in a robust way as yet. And I think that that is something that a lot of focus and a lot of energy has to go into. But I think that when the media tries to compensate, the media must look at due process, the media cannot pronounce people guilty or innocent. Right, uh, we have a ton of more questions, but uh, I'm afraid our, our time is up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over the floor to you, Mrs. Sekri, uh, for closing remarks from your panel. Uh, before we end this session. Right. Thanks, Meher. Um, so let me go around with closing remarks. Uh, but before that, just want to mention about uh, a media trial result of uh, uh, judiciary that doesn't quite work adequately. Uh, I would recommend the audience read. Uh, there was a Time Magazine cover story, I think, four or five years ago. And now a lot more has been written about the online disinhibition syndrome. Uh, people saw that the kind of stuff that you would say online, on social media, on posts, uh, was the same person would not say it in person. Uh, and this reporter actually went out and sought out these trolls to try to speak with them. And some of them would come, but then they'd like, they wouldn't engage, that they'd rather just abuse on, on online. Yeah. And that behavior pattern, I think, has extended into television studios. I think it's a little, lot more complex than judiciary or news. It's the... Uh, yeah. It's our, our brains are being rewired, but yeah, right. quick comments. Let me start with you, Abiru, um, before we say goodbye. Yeah, I mean, uh, so look, uh, like, like, like I think everyone mentioned, um, we have Jessica Lal, we have Arushi, and yet we have a Riya Chakravarti, and this this plays out over and over again. It's a, uh, uh, it's a Groundhog Day kind of situation. Uh, you have so. I always think that if if there's an appetite for this kind of uh, news or this sort of sensationalism 
or the kind of characters that you see uh, on your uh, on your television sets, then it's really not their fault. You know, it's a consumer who has to be, I suppose, more discerning as well. So you can't blame the media entirely for doing what it does. If uh, if you don't like it, don't buy it. Uh, pay for it, like you uh, have suggested. That way, you can, I think, hold the the people involved much more accountable. I'm sure you get a lot of flack, Abhinandan, for not doing your stuff right because people are actually paying their money right. to get to you, right? So I mean, but on the social media front, like I said, it's it's really like there's a there's a wag the dog situation. And there's a situation where everyone who is on any of these platforms believes unblinkingly that they are right and that everyone else is wrong. And they will watch exactly what they want and they will get to watch exactly what they want. I just had a small point of disagreement with, with Karuna about, you know, the these human beings behind the algorithm. I, it's, I, I don't think it's like, my understanding is that once that Frankenstein monster is let loose, it goes and does its own thing. Mark Zuckerberg didn't think of, you know, sitting and editing everyone's Facebook posts and f figuring out what they do. Okay. There's a program that does it. And unfortunately, the prog program is kind of, it, it multiplies. It's almost Darwinian in that sense. So it, it, it just keeps on multiplying on itself. And you have this sort of huge snowball which hits you in the face one day and we have a discussion like this one. All right, uh, then you come to Karuna, but if I could just plug my own conscience, the media rumble, which we're in partnership, uh, there's a session that's online on the ethics of the internet. And uh, this professor from Yale, uh, who is an ethicist and he's on the leading lights on this, has given a lecture on how these algorithms are written, what is the human intervention that actually went into it, and how that has kind of colored the whole thing. So eventually it comes down to human intervention. Um, but yeah, Karuna, okay. your remarks. Well, I think you're both right to limited, I mean, to a certain extent, right? Because when we speak mm -hmm. of algorithms, um, algorithms are created by people, firstly. Secondly, algorithms are of many different kinds. So you have artificial intelligence, which is different from an algorithm, which is not artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is an algorithm or a set of algorithms that kind of learns and, you know, can act in an independent way. Whereas the algorithms that are very frequently, that, that have historically been used have mostly not been AI. So the thing is that when it came to the Rohingya massacre, when it came to, um, on Facebook, and if you look at the Senate hearing committees, where Mark Zuckerberg was being questioned on these particular aspects, it was quite clear that they, couldn't be bothered, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when Twitter actually applied its mind to it, now Twitter is much more enthusiastic in the free speech direction. They don't do very much on hate speech, but they're much more enthusiastic in the free speech direction. But even then, it's become a meme, it's become a joke now, and I make those jokes too. But when Trump said, I won the election, right? They have a little spot saying official uh, sources found otherwise. So, mm -hmm. so now it's not that nothing can be done. There's a lot that can be done. And I think that there's a lot that must be done because when, uh, uh, as Abhinandan quite rightly said, you know, when, when you say Abhinandan that things are more complicated than that, that's why we're here right, to, to analyze complicated things. Um, that our brains are being rewired. Our brains are already wired to get that endorphin hit when we're looking at this phone. When we get a ping, we say, ooh, I wonder who thought of me. Or ooh, I wonder who liked my post. Or ooh, did I get, you know, 25 likes or did I get 3,000 likes, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you take a step back, we all know it's nonsense. All this like, check, it's all rubbish, right? But um, in another sense, it also drives, uh, it gives us a greater platform for our opinions, it gives us, in particular circumstances, it gives people, you know, it gives some people who run media houses, it means more money, it means more views, you know, like these are not, these are not nothing. And so I think that, of course, you know, a lot of what we are saying is coming from the social network, and I can tell that many, most of you have seen it, right? 
Right. Um, right. And I think it's very, very important to watch it. Because at the very least, what it does is it gives us an awareness of what we're doing. Yeah, and that and might be very that. difficult. I think it's very difficult for the individual consumer to be that conscious. And I think that actually having the strength to log out of at least some of the social media is important, but at the very least to be aware that you were being manipulated and to share maybe limited bits of what you want to share from your life. Okay, so to cut in, Karna, uh, Meher just tells me we are way over time. Uh, does, do we have just two minutes for Nagma and then we can wind Absolutely. up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just wanted to, just a couple of points, not much really to add. We've already, I mean, I just wanted to say it is a very difficult time, especially for us in television. And since I represent TV here, we take all the flag. But the big challenge, we all talked about views, even in TV, when very few people are actually watching television programs or the television sets. They're also watching it on YouTube. We put it out on social right. media platforms. Now the challenge is, and people do see how many likes did you get. And when you are, it's your show, then it matters. You have to, otherwise you will not probably have the show. So this difficulty with a lot of us who are trying to keep it all sane is to, to give uh, something, a good quality program, keep, keeping the sanity, but people may will still like it. So the challenge is that you cannot just say that I don't care. People don't like my what we are doing. Uh, but at the same time, give them quality program. That's a big challenge that we are facing. And the other point is, as audience, we need to be more discerning on what we are watching and how we are watching or consuming our news. And of course, there needs to be press freedom. But it, where does it end and where does the media trial begin? That's something that we have to actually keep in mind. Thanks, Nagma, Karuna, Averuk, and thank you, Meher, all yours. Thank Thanks you so much, much uh, to our chair and to all our panelists for giving us that uh, insider's view, that ringside view of what really goes on behind the scenes, whether it be in the legal system or uh, on our TV sets. Uh, and thank you so much to the audience out there for some amazing questions. I'm so sorry we had uh, we didn't have enough time. We had a barrage of questions, but uh, thank you so much. Those Some of the questions were really fantastic. So that's a wrap from all of us here at Tata Lit Live 2020 on the penultimate day of the festival. This was the last session. We have some exciting sessions happening tomorrow, like reading the game, cricket aficionados like uh, Anil Dharkar, Nasiruddin Shah, and Shashi Tharoor discuss their favorite books on the sport, chaired by Ayaz Memon. That's going to happen at 1 o'clock. And at 6.30, uh, sorry, 6 p.m., join us for Dreaming Up Multiverses, the many dimensions of Neil Gaiman, where we have the prodigious, Neil Gaiman in conversation with Jerry Pinto. And of course, we have our Sultan Padamsi Playwriting Awards and the Tata Literature Live 2020 Awards. So catch up on the schedule on our website, tatalitlive.in, and make sure you're tuned in to all the sessions. A uh, huge thank you to our title sponsor, Tata, and thank you once again for being online with us and tuned in to Tata Literature Live 2020. Good night, stay safe, and see you again once again tomorrow.